Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and dig in. Um, I believe we are recording. Yes, we are recording. So be aware of that. Um, don't, don't say anything too evil in the course of the next hour. Um, it is set up so that you all came in muted, uh, and I'll ask you to leave your microphone muted unless you're speaking, and that will um, help with everyone's audio quality. Um, and I'll introduce myself again because there are a few more folks who have popped on since, uh, since I introduced myself a few minutes ago. I am Don Haas. I'm the Director of Teacher Programming at uh, the Paleontological Research Institution, which is in Ithaca, New York. And um, I am PRI's only, up, in, up until a week and a half ago, I was PRI's only telecommuter. Now we are all telecommuters. Um, and I live in Buffalo. Um, I am also a, both a former high school uh, science teacher and a former uh, professor of science education and have been working at PRI since June of uh, 2008, so almost 12 years now. Um, and Alex, you want to say a few words about yourself? John's not on yet. Okay. Um, I'm Alex Moore. I'm also at the Paleontological Research Institution. Um, I'm a senior education associate there. My expertise is mostly in undergraduate level education. I've taught in various um, formal undergraduate settings for 35 years. And I've also done work with high school and middle school students. Right now, my focus is climate change. And so the resources that I'm going to share today are mostly about understanding climate change. And um, thank you. And we'll also, I think, be joined by John Hendricks. I, he should be on any minute, I expect, um, who is our Director of Science Communication. Um, and I'll ask you, for the sake of time, we won't go around and introduce everybody um, by speaking, but if you could put your name and where you're from and what you teach in the text chat, um, that'd be great. And if you're new to Zoom, if you just scroll to the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a, a chat bubble and you can click on that and type into the chat. So um, if you wanna just uh, give a name and, and where you're from and what you teach in a, in a sentence or so, that'd be great. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go to screen share and look at the agenda, um, <coughs> which I've actually made a copy of um, to write notes in, and there's a link uh, in the agenda that will take you to this this document that I'll that I'll be writing a few notes in. I don't know how much I'll I'll plug in there, but I might write some in. Um, so uh, uh, this is the first of two webinars with. Um, identical agendas. Uh, so we'll do this again on Wednesday. So if you've got colleagues that you think would be interested, um, they can um, certainly still register for Wednesday. Uh, and there you go. Um, and we've done that. Uh, and I want to start off with a few words about the interesting situation that we're in. Uh, a few of you have known me for a long time and have heard me complain mixed with praise for NGSS that um, the next generation science standards I think are are fantastic, but um, if we think it's redoing the educational system, I'm, I'm concerned that we're probably wrong about that. Uh, but suddenly, <laughs> we are redoing the educational system. I, I see um, standards ef efforts is akin to rewriting users' manuals for the educational operating system and thinking that maybe we re rewrote the operating system. Well, all of a sudden, we've abandoned the operating system that's been in place for um, hundreds of years, uh, particularly at the um, secondary uh, and tertiary level, the sec high school and college. Um, and we've got to come up with something on the fly, and that's stressful and not as important as uh, saving lives, which we're doing by staying home right now, um, but it's a hell of an opportunity that um, I think 
if we think carefully about, we can create new things. This will be a source of uh, innovations that will maybe uh, make positive changes uh, for a very long time to come in the educational system. And uh, I think there are a lot of reasons to be encouraged about that amidst all of the other things that are going on that are not so encouraging. I also think that uh, there are certain traditions we want to keep going. Um, there's a nice piece on uh, here that links to how Hamburg Middle School is continuing activities like morning announcements and spirit week and things like that. And I'll note that uh, Tom Adams, the principal uh, there is, is a college buddy of mine. Um, so that's kind of how that came to my attention. And I think he's doing a, a, a great, great job in continuing spirits along those ways. Um, and I'll pause for, um, to hear what you think about that for just a couple of minutes. So if you've got thoughts on any of that, chime in and I'm gonna flip over and look at the uh, chat and see who all's here. Um, but if you've got thoughts, go ahead and chime in. Which requires unmuting if you're muted. And I'll note that I'm planning to do a virtual science in the pub on that topic on Thursday night, and I'll send everybody the link for that once uh, once I have it fleshed out a little bit more. Hi, John. Um, and John has arrived. John, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. I'm John Hendricks. I am uh, Director of Science Communication at PRI. Thanks for joining us. Okay, I, so... I, I actually have one interesting comment that um, yes. the sort of... Dave Voorhees from Wabonzi Community College outside Chicago, by the way. Um, <clears> the <throat> sort of floating around some of the informal private discussions of faculty in that, um, you know, the administration is now going to see how that all, all of a sudden, oh, we can all do this online and we don't need face-to-face -face classes anymore. And um, so we have to be careful about, quote, unquote, how well we might do this online experiment um, for fear of administrators potentially saying, we don't need face-to-face -face classes anymore. Uh, let's do it all online. Just an interesting comment for yeah, yeah, for the discussion. Yeah, and and you know, related to that is um, recognizing that uh, it is educators who know the most about what the problems of the current system are, and uh, in a sense, this is an unshackling of teachers so um it is not an excuse to get rid of teachers <laughs> um it is an, a it is a uh, potentially a great um you know, like i said unshackling of uh, you know if you're frustrated by the constraints of the uh, um the clock and the calendar and uh, the state assessments and the various things that have driven us who have been in the public schools or in the not just public school but in the in the structures of um, education and have been frustrated by um, the things within those structures that limit us it's an opportunity to change it but it shouldn't be seen as an opportunity to um, uh, throw human resources aside Okay, on to the next chunk of the agenda, which is um, basically looking through a, a number of our resources and uh, saying a few words about each of them. And, and um, there are, uh, the agenda is linked with uh, to all these different places. So um, if you click here, it will take you to the web page on our new website, which I forgot to actually introduce um, at the beginning. So I'll, I'll flash back and do a little bit of that. Um, and uh, these are uh, links to uh, various resources for teaching paleontology and earth science um, from our web page. And let me go to the home page there and just say a few words about it. You'll see up at the top, there's 
Um, links to the Cayuga Nature Center and the Museum of the Earth are two public venues and the homepage for the, the parent institution there, which was founded in 1932. Um, and then we have recently added the, this Learn at Home banner. And maybe John, do you want to say a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, so like uh, Don just said, we added this banner recently, just as sort of a gateway to some of the um, resources that we already have, just to make it easier for, for you all to find them. I think maybe the most relevant of those um, links is the middle one, the one that says science education. If you click on that, can you click on that link, Don? Yep. So if you go there, it's, it's going to take you to a basically just a simple blog page that we've set up that lists some of our online resources just sorted out by intended audience. So we have resources for family, families and children, um, K-12 teachers and students, college faculty, and uh, and, and students, as well as uh, resources that might just be of interest to anyone and everyone. And we've got a uh, YouTube channel that we're adding content to pretty rapidly. Um, and let's go back to the agenda. <laughs> and uh, this, the next piece is also John. And actually, John, if you'd rather share your screen than my yeah. sharing it, I can stop sharing and let you take over. Does that sound like a good idea? It's a great idea if I can figure out what I'm doing. So. <laughs> yes, and please be patient with us. We're all trying to figure this out. Um, but to screen share, um, you just scroll to the bottom of the screen and at the bottom of the window, and there you go. That works. Okay. So, um, for the last oh seven or eight years, I've been working on a project called the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. And, and uh, if you want to find the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life, it's linked right off that, um, that page that Don was just showing you. We've got all kinds of different resources. I just want to focus on one of those for a few minutes here. But just to briefly introduce you to everything that's there. Um, so if you go to digitalatlasofancientlife.org, uh, you'll, you'll get to this homepage. Um, we have a bunch of different resources on there to help folks uh, identify fossils and just also learn about ancient life. Um, so one of, these, uh, one of these resources that we have are field guides to fossils from uh, different regions of the, of the country. We also have a mobile app associated with each of these um, sort of digital field guides to fossils. We have an online uh, paleontology textbook that we're continuing to build. We already have a lot of um, uh, content on there. We have virtual coll fossil collections. That's what I'm gonna spend a few minutes here talking specifically about. Um, we also have some virtual exhibits and also a page at the bottom that's, uh, that includes curricular materials for, um, uh, for teachers to use. But for now, what I wanna focus on are these virtual collections. So we can enter that page. You can also access it by just clicking on virtual collection at the top. Um, what these virtual collections are, are 3D photogrammetry models of fossil and modern specimens from the, both the collections and exhibits of the Paleontological Research Institution. And we have over 500 of these models now online. It's, it's really one of the largest collections of 3D models of fossils available anywhere. Um, we've divided them up by uh, just different taxonomic groups, essentially. Does anybody have a favorite taxonomic group that they'd like to see uh, highlighted? I'm willing to take requests. I know a lot of you are muted, so. Um, why don't we look at, let's do ammonites. Ammonites are always fun. So ammonites are, mollusks. So if we go in phylum mollusca, you know, the way that you guys should think about these are just as sort of virtual, you know, in a classroom setting, you might pull out drawers of actual fossil specimens. These are sort of arranged like virtual drawers. So if you want to see examples of... Uh, forums was actually suggested in the chat. Oh, forums was suggested. I'll go back to them after I, after I look at, at cephalopods. But again, all of these you can, you can look at on your own as well. Um, you click on cephalopods, so ammonites or cephalopods. You scroll down here, um, there's a brief introduction. Here's ammonoids, you can click there. 
And now we can get to some of the actual, actual 3D models. And let's see if I can find a good one to look at. They take just a little bit of a few seconds to load. So here's one example. This is a fossil ammonite from PRI's collections. You can load the model. You can then make it full screen by clicking that button. It loads. And then you can just spin these things around and look at them just almost as though they were real, real fossils. Um, I'm, you know, it's, it's just really neat. And you can zoom in, you can, you can kind of pan around. Um, they work, you know, they're, they're not as good as the real thing, but I think they work almost as well. Um, if you're doing a presentation for your students online, you know, I like to set it up just like this where you load a page and you just scroll through, you know, and, it, and if you want to do a comparison, you can load that model. You know, again, just hit the full screen button in the lower right hand corner. This one happens to have annotations, so you can use these little buttons at the bottom to just sort of cycle through the different annotations. Here it's identifying features of the um, of the ammonite sutures, these lines that divided the internal chambers of the ammonite when it was alive. To get out of this, you just click um, escape. Um, all of these models are hosted on a John. Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Somebody asked about the scale on the model. Oh, so. Is there a way to know what size the, the fossils are? There is, so this is one of the challenges of Sketchfab is there's not, a, of the platform that hosts these models is there's not a direct way to include a scale, but for every single model in the annotation, we've listed the, the, the size of the specimen. So even though there's no scale bar, you know, if this specimen, for example, is approximately 4.5 centimeters in diameter. So we do have scale information associated with, with almost every single model in the collection. Um, one of the other things that can be uh, done with these models is that you can actually view them directly in Sketchfab, and that's that's what I'm um, doing right now. So if I load up, if I look at one of these models and I load it up, and I click on the little blue icon in the lower left corner, it will take you to a website called Sketchfab, which actually hosts all of these different models. So you can think about Sketchfab as basically, you know, like YouTube is for video where you upload video and then it just sort of distributes them. That's basically what Sketchfab is for 3D models. Um, all of these 3D models can be uh, downloaded for free. They all have Creative Commons um, public domain licensing. So essentially you can use them for any purpose you want. You can, you can download the models and repost them on your own websites. Essentially you're free to do anything that um, you want with them. We have a huge collection. If you want to see the collection, you know, see all of the models at once within Sketchfab, um, you can do that. Uh, here's some of our most popular models. Um, you know, we have the, people like this crab. This is a modern day uh, crab specimen. So we do have we do have modern specimens for comparison with um, with the fossils. Sorry, my internet's just a little bit slow here. Um, you know, you can see all the all the features of this uh, rather ornery looking uh, crab here. You can zoom in on features of its, you know, of its of its face if you're if you're interested. If you There's also a question if these are true color. They are true color, yeah. So the way that the photogrammetry is made is essentially a um, you take 120 to 200 pictures of every single specimen. You you take those images and plug them into some fancy software called Agisoft. Agisoft then does like millions of uh, individual triangulations and creates sort of a, a mesh model. But then what's neat with these is that the photograph, the original photographic data is then overlaid on top of that digital model. And that's why they're photo realistic. That's different than what you'd get if you took, uh, say, a laser scan of a specimen. The laser scans have higher resolution, but you don't get the true color. And so the answer to the question is yes, these are um, true color uh, digital models. Um, if you want to share these models with your students, say you find a model that you really like, you go into Sketchfab and it's really easy to share it. You just click the share button beneath the model and you can just grab that. Um, you can just hit copy, you grab that uh, URL and then you can paste it wherever you want. If you have your own uh, website, if you're, if you're using something like 
uh, Squarespace or WordPress, I think it's generally possible to just include uh, an, uh, an embed box for video, and then you can go to embed uh, on Sketchfab, click uh, copy, it'll grab that code and you can just uh, dump that uh, code into the video box and then the model will just load natively like I showed in the, you know, that, that's what I'm doing here um, within the virtual collection website. So just to review, um, you know, everything that I've showed you uh, right now can be accessed through the video, the, sorry, the virtual collection off of the digital Atlas of Ancient Life. Um, there was a request for forums. I'll just show those and then I'll wrap it up. And you, there's also know. a question if there's information on key uh, identification characteristics. Yeah, so a lot of that information right now would be found within the um, Digital Encyclopedia of Ancient Life. So if we go, if we go there, under Digital Encyclopedia, if you wanted to know about these, like the Ammonites, for example, you'd come down to, I scrolled right past them, you'd go to mollusks, then you'd go to cephalopods, because Ammonites are cephalopods. And then you'd click on, here's the table of contents for that chapter, you'd go to Ammonoids, that page loads up. And then, it, yeah, it does have um, a lot of these key features that you see in the models and a lot of these pages have actually incorporated the models themselves so a student can both learn about the um, different types of fossils and interact with the models that i was just showing you right in that page so you can you know you can look at the features ammonite suture you can come up here and that reminds you uh, about what a what an ammonite suture is so I'll, I'll stop talking for a second here does anybody have any are there any questions that i can that I can answer. Yes, just very quickly, uh, what did you click to get to this part? Because I thought I saw something about a quiz activity on there, which might be very handy. Yeah, there's a quiz. So some of these pages have quizzes, some do not. Um, what, I, what we've done just for, to make it simple for uh, programming this stuff, is we've just created little flip card quizzes. These are essentially just self-tests. For students to, to test their own knowledge after they've looked at a page. So this says, you know, does this cephalopod shell show evolute, convolute, or involute coiling? So if a student had read the chapter, they'd look at it and they'd realize that it has convolute coiling uh, because of its particular features. Could you stick the uh, link for that into the chat? Yeah, just this particular page. Um, or the page that you link to it from? Yes. What I'll do is as soon as um, I'm done talking here, I'll put all of these links that I, that I just went through into the chat. Great. Are there any um, other questions? Okay. Okay. I will try now to figure out how to stop sharing. Okay, I think I got it actually. There we go. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so flipping back over to the agenda. Um, next up is um, uh, things on virtual fieldwork experiences. And we've got a lot of stuff there. I'll note the, and, and I'll also ask either uh, Alex or John to chime in if there's um, stuff in the chat that I should respond to. Um, so uh, we've been working on virtual fieldworks experiences for on the order of 15 years, actually, before I started um, working at PRI full time. I was working with Rob Ross on some grant funded programming. Um, so we've got stuff that goes back a long time. Some of the stuff that goes back a long time, uh, the technology has changed and, and doesn't work as well as it once did, but we keep on adding stuff and the, this, the newest virtual fieldwork experiences we have are from uh, the EPIC project. <coughs> and uh, there's a, a link there. And EPIC is Eastern Pacific Invertebrate Communities of the Cenozoic. Um, and it's a, a science project that is um, uh, digitizing biological uh, collections funded by the National Science Foundation. And most of the grant goes towards um, that effort of uh, digitizing the uh, collections of a number of um, museums and uh, other paleontological organizations. Um, 
the outreach piece is uh, developing virtual field work experiences. And uh, right now we have two online, uh, Central California, the Kettleman Hills, and the Central California Coast, uh, the uh, Parissima Formation. And I'm gonna just say a few words about um, uh, the Kettleman Hills um, VFE which uh, has five modules uh, and we'll take a look a little bit at uh, one or two of those. You can see the topics there and this is a click clickable image to take you to the different parts. Um, and uh, the uh, Explore the Landscapes, um, all of these, uh, all of the epic VFEs were created using um, Esri's uh, story maps uh, platform, uh, which is easy to make things that are are lovely and uh, pretty useful. Um, I'm trying to get you all out of the way. There we go. Um, so uh, this takes a look at the Kettleman Hills, which is uh, just to the west of the Central Valley, actually at the the very top of the Kettleman Hills, you can look west into the central, or look east rather, into the Central Valley. Um, and uh, you can explore uh, that landscape. Um, one of the driving questions for this is why are there sand dollars in the desert? The general driving question for the virtual fieldwork experiences that we've created is why does this place look the way it does with, um, looks as essentially a stand-in for why is it the way that it is. And we've, uh, we've come up with a lot of resources for um, digging into that question, a lot of supporting questions and a lot of um, tools and things that we'll take a quick glance at in the next uh, several minutes. Um, and here you can explore around um, and see the Kettleman Hills. And off over here is uh, California Central Valley. Um, and some questions to drive you through. This is satellite view. Um, the Kettleman Hills is this banana-shaped um, set of hills. And um, sort of zooming in and out at different levels to look at the place. And then um, uh, you can really zoom in and look at uh, um, some gigapans, which are uh, very high resolution images that are uh, mosaics of uh, hundreds of uh, pictures stitched together with the software. So here is a pretty interesting outcrop um, that you can uh, look at writ large and you can then zoom in um, to a level of detail where you can see individual grains in the outcrop um, and look at the fossils in there, which, um, come in a few different flavors. And uh, I'm gonna flip back over to the story map. Um, and there are, I think, four different gigapans in this one. This, this one takes a look at a, a different uh, member and uh, quite clearly shows lots and lots of sand dollars. And in a couple of places here, there are quarters hidden to show scale and stuff like that. Um, and there are, back in the story map, uh, questions to um, drive you through that in the different modules. Um, and there is, uh, um, if we scroll down a little further, we will get to, um, Sand, uh, sand dollars that are around today, and you can look at a embedded YouTube video of um, of what they look like when they're alive. Um, and there is a geologic map, which is pretty slow to load um, in full view, and it'll actually take a long time for it to load the whole state of California. But if you zoom in, it should load quicker. <laughs> there. There is a, a zoomed in version of the geologic map where you can click anywhere and get some um, information about uh, the particular uh, formations that you're looking at. 
and it steps you through some of that and then talking about um, fossil fuels and um, and how this uh, is important paleontologically for that purpose, how it came to form through uh, plate tectonics and some of the plate tectonic story. And then there's us um, who put this stuff together. And that is one of the epic ones. Um, we also have, um, we also do work in the critical zone and uh, the critical zone observatory network is a network of nine observatories around the country, uh, National Science Foundation uh, funded major scientific research project where interdisciplinary teams of scientists are studying the critical zone, which is kind of shown in uh, cartoon here, um, going from the tops of the vegetation to the bottom of the water table. Um, and interdisciplinary teams of scientists uh, that include geologists, hydrologists, botanists, um, ecologists, climatologists, um, engineers, and uh, uh, hydrologists, if I didn't say that, and, and so on, all working together to understand the interplay of rock, water, soil, and life, um, and doing some really, really interesting work. And um, the, uh, the critical zone is a new area of science that has produced some really interesting findings in the last several years. Um, one of my favorite bits of research that's really striking is that in some places there is diurnal variation at a depth of eight meters. So daily um, changes in what's going on at a depth below the surface of eight meters because of the action of roots. Um, and so uh, botanists working together with geologists to understand that, that interplay. And here are some of the driving questions for critical zone science. And um, this is looking at the Shale Hills um, uh, Critical Zone Observatory um, near Penn State. And some discussion of using virtual field work in the classroom and noting that um, pretty much everything in either an earth science course or a biology course plays out in some meaningful way. For a long time, I've been saying outside your classroom door, but outside your door, um, all of these things, almost all of these things play out in some meaningful way in your local environment. And so studying what's happening in your local environment is a great way to, um, to study the typical units of an earth science course or an environmental science course or a biology course. Um, an important point, uh, for a lot of our work is um, paying a, a attention to complexity. And some of you who know me have heard me say this more than once. We need to, uh, um, while it's important and valuable in many instances to simplify the seemingly complex, the world is a wickedly complex place. And very often we need to complexify the seemingly simple. And uh, I think the, the current crisis is an incredible way to, to highlight that. Um, and uh, there's um, some of the learning objectives and connecting to the next generation science standards. And um, uh, I'll also draw attention to the um, ambitious science teaching projects, uh, discourse primer for science teachers and um, using these four goals for discussion in classes works very nicely with virtual field work. Uh, and I won't go into that. I'll let you uh, dig into that on your own. Um, and I'll also, I do want to spend some time on the idea that uh, um, we, some of these are a little rough around the edges and that's, um, I don't know if I want to say intentional, but it's not unintentional. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I think that part of, well, one of our goals is that virtual field work should be a catalyst for actual field work. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do in all of these projects 
is flip the problem on its head of technology keeping people inside to using technology to document environments in a way that you can share it with other people. And um, so we put together um, some virtual field work uh, experiences that you should think of as not just ways to explore a particular place, but as models for exploring your own place. And um, I think the next thing on the agenda is looking at technical tools for um, making BFEs. And that opens up this page, which has uh, descriptions of mostly, once you've got the hardware and you've got um, internet access, most of the things on this page are free. Um, so the hardware being either a smartphone or um, a computer um, or a, a tablet, um, most of this stuff is free. Uh, so um, I'm going to uh, flip over to uh, QuickTime. John, you've got a question about whether there are um, examples of introductory general education college classes using BFEs. That's a good question. Um, yes, uh, um, I will add a, a link to Glenn Dolphin's work at the University of Calgary. Um, and some of you know Glenn, uh, aka Flipper, who's a former earth science teacher and now a geology professor at the University of Calgary, who's put together some uh, really phenomenal uh, virtual fieldwork experiences for his 400-ish student introductory um, geology course, and he's also written a nice article on it that was published in the um, Journal of Geoscience Education, uh, which uh, remind me to put that link, somebody remind me to put that link into the agenda if I forget to do it, um, and, uh, um, and links to, to how, he's, um, how he's using uh, virtual field work in his uh, class. <laughs> um, are there other questions I should be? I, I can see there are 15 comments in the chat. Um, should I look at those? <laughs> um, I think he's got most of it. Most of it's a request for links. Okay. Uh, okay. And the links are the links are are mostly there in the agenda. And if if they're not, let me know what they are, and I'll add them. Um, so I'm going to show you. So I'll flip over to the page that has links to these things, but I'm going to show you a, uh, at least a couple of the smartphone apps. I should pay attention to the time as well. Um, so, um, and I'll note that if you've got uh, a Mac and an iPhone, um, then you can share your screen from your iPhone uh, by using QuickTime, and I can uh, put info on how to do that in. Um, in the agenda or somewhere it's it's really pretty simple um and one of the things listed there is rocked which was uh created by folks i think at the university of wisconsin um and it's a free uh, uh smartphone app and you open it up and it will tell you uh using the gps on your phone it'll tell you where you are so i'm sitting in the allegheny plateau on Devonian age uh, bedrock that's uh, church sandstone and limestone um, of the Lois Blanc uh, or Bois Blanc uh, uh, limestone strati uh, stratigraphic unit um, and I can click on that and get more uh, info on the particulars of uh, the unit and you can see it's a pretty detailed description and you can do this for anywhere in the country um, and um, you can also look at uh, the geologic map by just clicking on the map icon and you can pinch to zoom out and click anywhere on there so you can see i'm not too far from niagara falls if i click here this will tell me about the camilla syracuse and vernon um, formations and there are the lockport group um, and and so on. Um, so other stuff that's in here, there's a Brunton compass, so you can actually record the dip and the strike um, wherever you uh, are and put that on, on top of the stuff. You can see the um, paleo uh, geography from when the particular unit you're standing on formed and you can scroll through um, time with the little scroll uh, 
thing at the top. Um, and it's a pretty uh, sweet, um, sweet little free app. And I'm gonna back out of that and see if there's other stuff that I wanna look at right now. I'll point out the uh, existence of Firefox and just mention that it's there. Um, and that allows you, Firefox allows you to access all of the instrumentation in your, uh, uh, in your phone and collect data with it. And it also, uh, also um, put together with funding from the National Science Foundation. And this one actually has lab activities and other activities associated with it. We, are, we, we were not involved in, in any way in the making of that app, but it's pretty cool. And we want to bring- Don, question. Yes. Uh, uh, about what the first app was called. Yeah, okay, we've got it. Rocked, R-O-C-K-D. Yep. Yep. Um, and I would throw out there too, if you all use flyover country, you don't need to be in an airplane to use right. flyover country. You can do it sitting still. And it's, it's similar to what you saw in yeah. Rocked. Yeah, and so flyover country, um, I can, we'll take a look at that too. Back out of here. And flyover country, I put in my um, travel folder, which I'm not going to be doing <laughs> uh, for a long time. Um, but uh, you can um, create a path um, to go wherever. So if I'm going to drive from uh, Buffalo to Ithaca, Um, click done and create path. It'll make um, a drive where it shows um, what you what you will see along that path. And if you're in your car as the passenger, not that you shouldn't be doing this while you're driving, <laughs> um, you can look at the the various uh, all the things that pop up along your way. So. Um, the color codes indicate different uh, um, classes of things. So I don't remember my colors, but uh, apparently yellow is landscape features. This uh, tannish is uh, mammal fossils. Oh, well, that's not quite right. Um, but anyway, you can play around with that and, and see um, what, you, what you've got. And you can save it for offline um, use, which is nice if you're either uh, going into a rural area or you're flying and don't have um, internet access while you're in flight or don't have uh, a lot of bandwidth anyway. Um, so um, then we've got uh, uh, smartphone and tablet apps. So those that we were just looking at are for accessing information about a field site. The next set of things here are uh, for capturing aspects of the site. Um, so this picture is not just a picture, it's a, a full spherical panorama that was created using um, Google Street View, uh, the Street View app, which is um, different than uh, Street View within Google Maps. Um, and I'll flip back over to my phone and go into my photography folder and open up Street View, um, which, um, uh, I created the panorama we were just looking at using my phone and <laughs> be embarrassed and show my living room. Um, if you open up the app and um, do this, it will uh, help you, guide you through the, um, what you need to do to create a panorama. Um, and you can see uh, down at the bottom of my screen, there's a white circle with a check mark in it that's got yellow indicating that I've gone almost 25% of the set of pictures that I need to do um, to make a full panorama. And it will turn green when you've got the full 360 uh, spherical panorama. And um, you can actually uh, stitch it while it's incomplete. and um, Pegman, um, Pegman runs across and um, puts the pieces together. And there is a look at my living room. Um, and, um, and we created it that quickly and we could publish it to Google Maps. I'm not gonna publish my living room to Google Maps, <laughs> um, but you can do it that quickly and um, share it with your, with your friends. 
Um, I will take a very quick look at Turnio as well, um, which Turnio right now is only available. And I try and click on my computer and that doesn't work. Um, Turnio Creates is a free app um, that allows you to um, create uh, 3D models. And um, <laughs> that's kind of funky. Um, and I will just begin that process. I'll also note that I was really worried that this was going away. Um, but it's seen a very nice update earlier this year, so it's not going away. And you just move it around, and it captures uh, what's, uh, what your, is in the center of your thing. And this creates models like the uh, fossil models that um, John was showing earlier, but it's a free app that's on your phone. Um, yeah, so um, we'll take a quick peek at the last model that I made using my phone, um, which was a uh, dead sperm whale washed up on the beach in Oregon when we were, when we were out there to uh, create a virtual fieldwork experience for um, the Oregon coast, which will be the next one that we create. So there was this uh, probably about 15 foot long um, dead sperm whale that I walked around and uh, um, made a model of, which is pretty gross, but also pretty cool. And I unfortunately forgot to put anything in it for scale. Um, but this was created with a free app on my phone. <laughs> so, um, so let me flip back over to here. Let's see what else we've got. Um, so there are other other things that you can um, poke around on related to that. Um, and uh, uh, one other one that we'll take a look at for a web-based tool is Touch Terrain. Um, and Touch Terrain was again created by uh, uh, folks at um, with NSF funding um, at. Uh, um, the uh, at Iowa State University and what you can do with this and I should have um, had my 3D models on hand is you can make um, uh, 3D models of anywhere um, so let's see um, we'll go to Ithaca if I can scroll myself out which I need to move you all out of the way for that. It does not yet have a search box. Oops, and I've gone plenty far. Um, so you actually need to scroll on the map um, to wherever it is you want to go. We'll go to Niagara Falls. And once you've got where you want to be, you um, can recenter the box in the current view. And I'm going to zoom in a little further. Yeah. And um, it defaults, the defaults, whoops. Uh, that's weird, where did the rest of the box go? Um, uh, the defaults work, work pretty well, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna um, just use the defaults. And what this is gonna do is create a 3D model of the topography. Um, and, um, you can also scale these together. And if you've got a 3D printer, you can do this. If you don't, you can um, uh, upload it to the web and have someone else print it for you, which will keep it, people in business in this currently weird time. Um, and um, uh, what's going on? And it'll think for just a minute and 
um, create a model that, like I said, if you've got a 3D printer, you can print it out, which is, you know, as I'm thinking about this, probably not real helpful for the current situation, especially since it doesn't seem to be working. So we'll skip past that for, oh, there we go. Um, so there is the 3D model, which does not look to be a very good resolution. So something screwy with this one. So forget about this part of the of today, <laughs> but know that it's there and it's kind of, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, and let's see if there's anything else I wanna um, do here. Um, somehow we John, do we need to be concerned about time? Yes, we need to be concerned about time. So I will get away from that and go back here. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, we have lots more to, to share. Um, so the Teacher Friendly Guides to Earth Science, we'll just take a quick peek at. These are regional guides to the earth science of seven different regions. When you put them all together, you've got the whole country. Um, PDFs of these are all free. Um, so, as I said, there's, there's the whole country, um, and uh, be aware that that's there. We'll take a look at um, the, uh, visit the website for the Midwest one, which is an HTML, um, and you can see the set of chapters that we have that um, is common across almost all uh, the regions, not every region has glaciers for obvious reasons, uh, has a glacier chapter for obvious reasons, because not everywhere has been glaciated, uh, but that's an overview of, of what's there. And these, um, all of our teacher-friendly guides were written um, with the scientifically literate person in mind who's teaching and maybe suddenly teaching a, in a content area that is not their um, area of expertise. So think of the biology teacher who suddenly becomes an earth science teacher. And that's a good way to think of uh, one of the audiences for that. Um, we'll take a very quick peek at the Climate Change and Energy Program's um, web page on uh, the PRI website. Um, and you can see what all is there. And um, the teacher friendly guide to climate change. Um, uh, and associated resources with that. Uh, and that also has its own page. Um, and I will note also the award-winning teacher-friendly guide to climate change, um, which uh, we are working to get out to uh, teachers all over the country. Um, and um, some associated resources with that. Um, the um, climate change uh, clearing houses for um, New York and uh, Massachusetts are both managed by Ingrid Zabel, um, who is our climate change education resource manager or some such title, um, and the uh, curator for the New York and Massachusetts clearing houses for uh, climate change um, science, climate science. Um, and um, this has a lot of GIS resources for looking at climate change. And we also have a page on climate change in central New York, which is not most of you. And do you wanna say stuff about the environmental uh, data page, uh, Alex? Um, I actually have never seen the environmental data page. <laughs> I think it's new. <laughs> but oh, okay, I think it's cool. also connected to things that you've been more involved with than I have. Right. So, yeah, we have um, been working to deploy instrumentation around the our home base at PRI in Ithaca, New York, and the um, Cayuga Nature Center, which is one of our other venues. And we're trying to collect pretty simple environmental measurements over a period of time. Um, and so these some of which are available in real time on the web and some of which we upload um, episodically so that people can take a look at it. But the idea is as we develop these resources, the idea is to get 
students and teachers outside in the environment with really simple tools, with a thermometer, for instance, or with a series of thermometers to be able to make measurements yourself. Now, that was the idea before um, all of us can't actually go and interact with our students anymore. So one of my jobs over these next couple weeks is to try to um, present these in a way that you can look at independently or that your students can look at independently and um, make these experiments or make these measurements virtually and understand what the data are telling us about what's happening in our environment um, as we go forward in, in real time. Thanks. And um, that's time for wrapping up. Uh, there's an evaluation form that uh, a key question on there is, uh, are you interested in um, webinars that dig into things that we glanced at in just a few minutes today and spending a full hour or potentially longer on? I mean, we could, we could, there are many, many things here that we could do multiple webinars on. So this is just scratching the surface. Um, so the evaluation form um, I, is here. Um, and please just take a few minutes to, um, to fill that out. And I'll also note that down at the bottom is a uh, place to donate to support our work so we can keep on doing this. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a challenging time for uh, public venues that get some of their revenue from um, people coming and paying admission. We're not going to be doing that for a while yet. So if you can kick in a few bucks or become a member of PRI, that would be awesome. And uh, uh, we'll stick around and take questions, comments, uh, whatever. If you've got um, uh, things you want to say, um, the agenda is done except for the 